Welcome to the Alcohol Minimalist Podcast. I'm your host, Molly Watts. If you want to change your drinking habits and create a peaceful relationship with alcohol, you're in the right place. This podcast explores the strategies I use to overcome a lifetime of family alcohol abuse, more than 30 years of anxiety and worry about my own drinking, and what felt like an unbreakable daily drinking habit. Becoming an alcohol minimalist means removing excess alcohol from your life so it doesn't remove you from life. It means being able to take alcohol or leave it without feeling deprived. It means to live peacefully, being able to enjoy a glass of wine without feeling guilty and without needing to finish the bottle. With science on our side, we'll shatter your past patterns and eliminate your excuses. Changing your relationship with alcohol is possible. I'm here to help you do it. Let's start now. Well, hello and welcome or welcome back to the Alcohol Minimalist Podcast with me, your host, Molly Watts, coming to you from, well, what do you expect? It's raining here in Oregon. I mean, not only is it raining, folks, it is raining. It has been raining. Cats and dogs, in all seriousness, we have, you know, flooding warnings now and uh, the forecast for the week is rain with intermittent spurts of cloudiness, but mostly rain. There's like a storm front coming in every other day and it's just nonstop. It's relentless. And my backyard, I have a, um, a bocce ball court back there. It looks like a lap pool right now. There's a, there's a plastic cover over the top of it and about, um, I don't know, three inches of water standing on top of it. Oh, someone take me away. Take me, I'll go and take me away from, from, from Oregon in the winter. Right. I know I'll stop complaining. It doesn't help. It's just the way it is around here. And I am on my way as a matter of fact, to some sunnier, drier weather this weekend. So I am looking forward to that today on the podcast. I am sharing a conversation I had with Ken Middleton. Now, I had learned about Ken from my friend Janet Garand over at Tribe Sober, and Ken actually reached out to me asking me if he thought that, uh, if I thought a collaboration or a conversation would be uh, a good idea, and I definitely wanted to talk with him. Ken is someone who has made the decision to be alcohol-free. He created a community online called Alcohol Ain't Your Friend or Is Not Your Friend, alcohol is not your friend. Yeah, that's it on Medium. I will link it in the show notes. And he has written a book called Bamboozled, and that is coming out soon. And I just loved our conversation. He believes he has coined the term alcohol consciousness. And I said, hey, I am all with that because I've coined the term term alcohol minimalism. So you can be alcohol conscious. And I think it's some sort of, and I say that at the end, some sort of Venn diagram, right? Everyone who is alcohol conscious or everyone who's an alcohol minimalist is alcohol conscious. And everyone who is alcohol conscious, I hope will become an alcohol minimalist. So I think you're really going to enjoy hearing from Ken. He's got a lot of great energy and he's really dedicated to helping people change that powerless story and that powerless narrative. So Here is my conversation with Ken Middleton. Hey, Ken, thank you so much for being here on The Alcohol Minimalist. I am super excited to have this conversation. You reached out to me. We have a mutual friend, Janet Garand, and her work over at Tribe Sober. And I am just super excited to talk to somebody else who considers something you've, you've coined a term too. So I believe I've coined alcohol minimalist. You believe you've coined. What? Alcohol consciousness. Alcohol consciousness, which I love because really we're kind of on the same, we're on, we're definitely on the same vibe. So talk to me a little about how you got here, where this came from, and kind of what work you're doing in the world of alcohol consciousness. Thank you so much, Molly. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, yeah. So to your point, and we talked about this a little bit a while ago, like the alcohol consciousness is not about giving up alcohol. Like that is one of the common misconceptions people think 
when they think about when they read alcohol is not your friend and they read the book or going to read the book bamboozled that's never been my intention for me alcohol consciousness is about if you decide to drink I just want to make sure you are aware of the trade-offs you're making when you make that decision. And I wasn't aware of that. So Mm -hmm. to go back to my story, what happened with me was I started drinking in college as most people did and alcohol became one of my best friends. Hence the name of my Mm -hmm. medium publication, I call it not your friend because it did everything that people said it would and that I thought I needed in my life. So it was hard for me to talk to women. Alcohol made it a lot easier. I wasn't that natural around other people that I didn't know. Alcohol made me get out of my comfort zone and just be the life of the party, if you will. And it just made life so much better than what I thought it was before that it Mm -hmm. became that easier of life from 19 on to the age of that I finally gave up progress a little forward and I get a job in sales. So if college is an environment in which alcohol is is greatly (laughs) promoted, sales environment is one that does so in the real life. So I did sales and worked with an organization in which my job was to take my clients out, schmooze them, had a corporate account. And so when you can think about how the volume of alcohol increased tremendously is just the reality of it. And often Mm -hmm. when we look at our drinking, it is relative to those around us. So as I looked at my peers, I wasn't drinking more than they were. Like there were a lot of them that were drinking more than me and people that were more successful than I was in the company. So at that point, I didn't have a problem. Where it came to a head is when I decided to leave my company in 2017 to start my own business, entrepreneurship, staffing, business my own. And I was 18 months into it and I just wasn't successful. I was doing okay, but I wasn't doing great. And Mm -hmm. for me, I always had this saying of my 70, 80% was better than most people's 100%. Because after I drink, I knew I wasn't 100%. The next day, I knew that I had the hangover, the brain fog. I knew Mm -hmm. I wasn't amazing, but I always felt like I was still doing the job well enough. When I tried to do my own company, that just wasn't good enough. And I said, I didn't want to go back to corporate America until I can unequivocally say I've given everything I can to make this business work. So I stopped drinking. I said, I'm just going to give myself a break for 30, 60, maybe 90 days and see what happens. I made more money, Molly, in that next three months that I had made in the entire previous nine months. And wow. when that happened, I was like, holy shit. Like, I don't know if we can curse. I apologize. <laughs> we can't. But I was like, holy shit, okay. there's something here. There's, there, there is something here. And then from that, I just continued to grow and learn. And it was around the education that once I started to open up my mind and realize all the lessons I never learned in high school, I never learned in college around what alcohol does to you and how it hurts yeah. you and damages your ability to think. And then I said, I want to educate others on that. And it's not about quitting, but as I said, it's just about you knowing, and then you make that the choice consciously if that is what you want to do for the rest of your life. And that's what bamboozled is about. Yeah. So that's, again, that's why you and I align on so very much because I am, I, I talk science all the time. I talk neuroscience. I talk blood alcohol t- content. I talk all about the science of alcohol because for me, that is definitely what happened. I had a different journey, a different relationship, but much more uh, for a lot longer, first of all, and also just more daily drinking. I was never a big drink. I wasn't like a, you know, a binge drinker. I didn't like to over drink very much. I came from an alcoholic family. So, um, or my mother was an alcoholic diet of her disease. Mm-hmm. So I, um, did not want to, um, I didn't want to follow down that path. And I had a very, so I, I was kind of you know, had some rules around myself that I followed all the time, but I was very, very much a habit drinker and daily drinker and definitely drinking far more than I realized just to your point was really bad for me. Right. Like, Mm -hmm. because I was the same way. Like I figured, well, I'm I'm not, I don't have a problem. I have, you know, I get up, I have a full-time job. I have kids. I'm very productive. You know, I never really understood or never admitted to myself how much that low level anxiety, which I had probably because of my alcoholic upbringing, there was an anxiety that was ever present about worrying about whether or not I was going to, you know, teeter down the edge and go off the edge. And could I become an alcoholic over time? Things like that. I never wanted to um, just really appreciate how much that was taking away from me being my the fully best version of myself. Right. Right. 
And so when I decided to change my drinking habit, I kind of went about it in a different way, but I, the, in terms of just, because I just had been doing it for so long, I had the same things. I had a lot of stories around alcohol that I believed were true, right? Like I believed that I needed to drink alcohol to unwind and de-stress at the end of the day. Like Mm -hmm. that was something that I absolutely 100% believed. So investigating the science of alcohol, understanding the effects on my neurochemistry and how it actually was perpetuating my stress yeah. and anxiety, right? Not understanding that chemical reaction that I was causing for myself. And when I did, that allowed me to challenge those beliefs that I had around alcohol that I was that it was that it was helping me unwind. I was like, yeah, actually that's not true. It's making it harder for me to relax and unwind. So That part you and I completely agree on, right? We have to appreciate and understand that alcohol is toxin. It is a known carcinogen. We can do all this without being a scare tactic, right? Right. Isn't to scare people straight. And that's something that I always get because people, there are lots of things in this world that are unhealthy for us that we consume, right? And alcohol isn't the only thing that we're talking about here in this world. There are different, you know, and and different behaviors. If we don't exercise, if we don't sleep well, if we don't, if we got a lot of inherent stress. So this isn't about demonizing alcohol, at least for me. And I think you would agree, right? Yeah, I'm I'm with you, Molly, because you hit the nail on the head. That's why I use the term alcohol consciousness, because it is a derivative of health conscious. And it's just you making the decision that you are going to be mindful of what you're drinking and you're aware of it. To your point, that's a great point. If you don't drink alcohol, but yet you eat crap and you never exercise, (laughs) then you might as well drink alcohol as much as you want. Because, you know, the the number one killer in the United States is heart disease is and and diet and 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 um obesity related right. illnesses, right? So that's kind of, if we want to demonize anything, it's probably that more so than alcohol, but alcohol is something else that I just feel like a lot of people aren't aware of. We hear all this time about how alcohol is good for you and how one oh, or two yeah, glasses right? a day helps, but right. in the long run, it really affects you tremendously. And so through with Anuf and in Bamboozled, I, exactly what you said, it's around sharing the, the science around it, how it affects your hippocampus, how it ha- affects your ability to um, age well and effectively, how it affects your relationships, how it affects yeah. your finances. We look at all the different aspects of it, and we just want to make sure people, as you are making this decision, you are aware that this is something that could affect your life over time. In yeah. a much more negative way. Right. I totally 100 percent And you and I again preaching to the choir because mm-hmm. in my I have a, a an ebook alcohol truths, how much is safe. And okay. I talk about physical health, mental health, or social health and financial health because we got to look at relationship health. We got to look at it all, right? Yes. And and the bottom line is, and there's no punchline here, the safest amount of alcohol is zero. There is no safe amount. So, you know, and you and I have both done the work in terms of educating ourselves to that degree, but that still, I am an alcohol minimalist. So Mm -hmm. I accept the risks that I take in terms of how I offset that, right? I'm very conscious about it. (laughs) Alcohol conscious. I'm very, (laughs) you know, I make it, I'm very intentional about how I include alcohol in my life. I think the big difference too, and kind of you talked about it, like you had some learned behavior, some learned stories about what alcohol was doing for you, right? Like yep. you believed you had things that you, uh, you know, that it helped you be more social, that it helped you, um, you know, it was fun. It was is something that helped you unwind, probably relax and help you talk to women, et cetera. These are well-patterned, well-rehearsed uh, stories that many of us have around alcohol. And the thing of it is that we have to, no matter whether we choose to be completely alcohol-free, to be an alcohol minimalist, to be alcohol conscious, I needed to learn how to manage my mind. And I needed to realize I never understood the connection between my thoughts and my feelings mm-hmm. and how those how those two interacted. 
I kind of, you know, didn't realize that I could actually create confidence, fun, et cetera, that I was capable of feeling confident, relaxed without alcohol, because just the way that I thought I was continually feeding thoughts that made it seem like I was needing the alcohol when in fact, those thoughts were driving the desire for alcohol. When I learned how to not do that and actually like create a different feeling that then I didn't desire to drink as much. I could feel calm and relaxed without needing alcohol to do it. I'm telling you. So you hit the nail on the head on a few things there that I, I we go into it in the book and I, 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 I um, applaud you from addressing. So one is around where do we learn these behaviors? Where did that come from? So with your situation, perhaps, and I don't know your fi- entire story, but perhaps your mom seeing the things that happened that could affect you either positively or negatively, you could just look at her and say, hey, I'm not going to do that. Or you could look at her and say, well, that's what my mom did. And that's natural. And that's what mm-hmm. people do. Right. So there's that. The other aspect, Molly, that I think is so very important is how we're socially engineered from a very young age that everything we see around us involve alcohol. So how many Mm -hmm. times, and I often think about it, baby showers, wedding showers, all the kids' parties, all of these things that if you think about it, it does, you don't need alcohol there. There always is alcohol there. And people just get so used to it being a part of their lives that they don't even think about, does it make sense to include it? The other right. aspect is something that I really hit on in the book. And I think is very important. If you compare alcohol to cigarettes, most people look at cigarettes. I think the, the percentage of people who smoke now is around nine, 12% of people in the world smoke, as opposed to the percentage of people who drink is around 60%. Cigarettes were thought to be kind of normal 40, 50, 60 years ago, right? Smoking on planes, smoking in restaurants. Now we recognize how terrible it is. For that reason, they outlawed it in movies. They outlawed it in advertising because they recognized that when someone saw James Dean smoking in a movie 45 years ago, that made kids want to do it. They didn't do that with alcohol. And if you look at movies and series and anything you watch, alcohol is included in everything. So where did I learn that? You needed to drink alcohol in college. Where did I learn that that's going to make me talk to women easier? It was from television. It was from all these things I'd seen at a very young age. Prime example, my wife and I watched the the, the Puss in Boots movie not too long, uh, I think Saturday, which <laughs> right? is actually pretty good. And you got, you, got, you got my man Puss in Boots drinking ale. It's a G-rated movie and he's drinking in a bar. Right. And so it teaches you at a young age that alcohol is a normal part of your life and that's right. what you should do and it doesn't affect you. But the thing we learn at, over time is that two things. One, there's really no concept of a normal drinker. So I share with you that they say about 60, 60% of people drink, right? That's over the course of their life. The, yeah, the right. fact that a lot of people don't realize and don't know is <laughs> 60% that 60% of people who do or 60% of the U.S. population drinks less than one drink a week. I know. I less know that because a week. I know, I know. I, I, when I've heard that, when I heard that statistic, I've shared that statistic on the podcast before blew my mind. I was yes. like, what are you talking about? I thought everybody drank like me. Like literally I thought like, wait, what? Hold it's, on. You mean there's people that only drink like, like the majority of people only drink less than one drink per week. That feels really weird to me. I have no crazy. idea. Easy, But it, but so the belief of you can have one or two drinks a night and you're okay, where a lot of right. people think that adds up and that starts to build the dependency. And once, if you drink what the CDC recommends, one or two drinks a night, that puts you around 14 drinks a week at the max, which will put you right at the cusp of the top 80th percentile of people who drink through it in the entire nation, 20% of people yeah. that like, yeah. so you're, so the concept of the normal drinking isn't true. Most people either don't drink at all or they drink once a, once every three or four months. Like it's, it's, it's a, it's not something that they do on a regular basis. And then the other thing you hit on is so important when you drink and you make it a natural part of your life, you think that is helping the anxiety, but one, it's not helping at all. It's making it worse. It's exacerbating it. And two, it actually, and there's been scientific thoughts about this or studies around this, it can create the anxiety. Yeah. So right. you may not have it before, but once you start drinking to ease yourself, it creates the anxiety and makes it worse for you. And it right. becomes a debilitating cycle. Well, the, the, the fact of the matter is that it is, I mean, alcohol is a chemical agent and it, it is 
It is water soluble and fat soluble. It it affects every organ, every every cell of our bodies, Everywhere. and our our neurochemistry, the neurotransmitters. It it affects the brain immediately, and you cannot affect the neurochemistry of the brain. The the brain is constantly seeking homeostasis when we alter that chemically, whether, and I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm sorry, folks. And I, I, there are people that are staunch believers that, you know, that CBD and, and cannabis and marijuana are better for you because they're, you know, not they're They don't have the same toxins and stuff as alcohol. I've got news for you. When you impact your neurochemistry, you are impacting your neurochemistry and there's no, the, the, the brain is constantly seeking homeostasis and that is what it is going to do. So it will, it will drive up your anxiety when you don't have a chemical depressant in your system anymore. That's what it does. It just is, it's trying to get back up to normal. And the only way it knows how is to rebound after you've chemically depressed it. And so the, And I totally get that. The thing with alcohol and, you know, so everybody that's listening and I always talk about it from here is just it's dose dependent, right? So the reason that most people don't, like if you're only drinking a drink, you're not going to feel that rebound anxiety as much as somebody who's drinking three or four drinks. That's just the way that it is dose dependent. And the, the reason that the low risk limits exist don't exist because of they have the the low risk limits that are put out by the NIAAA, which is what I talk about are, you know, no more than one standard drink for women on any given night or no more than one standard drink per day, seven standard drinks per week, 14 for men, and no more than three on any occasion. Right. Those stand, those low risk limits exist to help that because that's, what's been shown that. If you stick to those limits, you will are statistically not likely less than 2% chance to develop alcohol use disorder it does not have anything to do with your, your, your neuro, your anxiety, your yeah. best li- life, your longevity, your, your cancer risk it has nothing to do with that folks. So let's be clear. The low risk limits exist from the NAAA, like I said, to help people avoid developing alcohol use disorder, valuable information, but they're not designed to help you achieve your best life. They're not designed to help you feel the benefits of taking multiple alcohol-free days, which I talk about all the time. Hey everyone, just a quick break to talk with you about Sunnyside. Now, you've heard me mention Sunnyside many times before. You've heard me talk with Nick and Ian, the founders of Sunnyside. And I just want to share with you why I am so passionate about this company. They are way more than just a drink tracking app. They are really about helping people create a mindful relationship with alcohol. And they stand for a life that is about having more not less, right? There are more rested mornings, more days when you're feeling your absolute best, when you have more energy and positivity. Sunnyside is not there to tell you to never go out, to never drink, but they are there to help you enjoy your life and to wake up and be ready to be your shining best. It is not an all or nothing approach. It is friendly, it is approachable, and it is absolutely judgment free. They want to be a solution that fits into your unique lifestyle. And I think that's exactly what they've created. You can register for a free 15-day trial. Go to www.sunnyside.co slash minimalist to get started. That's www.sunnyside.co slash minimalist to try Sunnyside today. I know you, I think I've read an article that you're not really, you're not a real fan of dry Ah, it's not my thing. I mean, it's cool, <laughs> but it's like, ah, it's such a fad in my opinion. And to your point, I, 30 days is cool going alcohol free. I think it's cool, mm-hmm. but I think you can really get true benefit for going longer. For me, it took a little bit longer. I did see a lot of benefit after two weeks and then I saw more benefit after four weeks. But once I got to 90 days, that's when I really started to see the major benefits. And I'm not saying that 
you shouldn't do dry January, but I just challenge people to give themselves an opportunity to see where they could go by doing a dry 90. Cause I think yeah. it, the compound effect of you not drinking would be a, a felt a great deal better over a 90 day period versus 30. Okay. All right. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm in the midst of, I'm it, one of the other things I really liked about, uh, I, I can't remember which article I was reading from you, but um, you know, I am looking at my dry, my dry January experience this year. I'm approaching it with this idea of maximum effort and I'm approaching it in the terms of, and that doesn't have anything to do with alcohol because I'm not worried about not drinking for 30, 31, you know, that's, that's going to happen regardless. Right. But it's more about just kind of taking the opportunity to ask myself every day, like, is this, the, you know, is this your maximum effort for today? Can you do, you know, are these the, the, the food choices you want to be making? Are these the, are you incorporating enough water into your world? Are you moving your body enough? You know, everything, because again, when we do dry January, if we take it into the, if we just try to clench our fists and white knuckle it through 31 days and abstain, right? Yeah. There will be physical benefits because there's benefits of taking that much time off drinking period, but right. the thought work and actually allowing ourselves to, to lean in, to give ourselves that opportunity to, to really be the best versions of ourselves is there too. If we want to do that work, we want to do the thought work and yeah. Hey, why not try dry 90 folks? If you want to really, you know, go, go check out, go talk to Ken and he'll inspire you to do dry 90. That's it. So, Molly, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. So alcohol consciousness, the other side of that is being conscious about using your sobriety or your um, lack of drinking alcohol to build that best version. Because I would argue that when you're not drinking, if you're not doing anything to try to enhance yourself, you're wasting right. the night. You might as well be drinking. Like you need to push yourself in some way. And so for me, when we talk, when you hear early about anxiety and the fact that it creates it a debilitating, the other side of drinking is that it doesn't allow you to do the hard work to fix the problem yourself. And mm. so um, I had a podcast meeting with a guy named Jeff Graham recently, uh, recently back to zero, his podcast with um, Peggy Cooney, which was awesome. And we talked about men and the fact that a lot of men don't address their, their drinking problem. You have a lot of women that are just, you know, they're more open and more vulnerable where you got men, you got a manly man that they don't want to really talk about it. And we asked the question of, is, is alcohol really the problem? The, mm -hmm. Alcohol is a symptom of the problem, but the problem right. really is addressing and looking internally around who you are and, and how you're approaching things. And are you really solving problems? Alcohol for the longest has been that thing that makes it easy for you not to have to address the problem. So you have a bad day at work. Instead of addressing why you have a bad day at work, you come home and you drink. You get in an argument with your spouse. Instead of identifying and talking through that argument, you drink to feel better. You had a hard yeah. day with your kids. Instead of trying to be a better parent and understanding what you need to do to do better, you just drink to feel better. So the beginning of releasing alcohol and stop drinking, it's not the, the it's, it's not the end answer, but it's the beginning answer of you becoming the best version of wellness. So I tell people I'm not an addiction coach. I, I, I don't have the ability. If you're truly physically and physiologically addicted to yeah. alcohol, I'm yep. not qualified to help you. Yep. Well, you I consider, yep. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a wellness advocate. And I want mm -hmm. people to build because the beginning of the getting rid of alcohol, then you can look at your eating. Then you can look at your exercise. You can look at your sleep. You can look at your mental acuity. You can look at all these different aspects of it that if you don't get rid of alcohol first, though, for a lot of people, and I was one of those people, you don't have the ability to address all the other issues that you need to focus on. Yeah, I, I agree with you. For me, alcohol was the thing that I needed to, to address first because it had been a long standing habit and a habit for me that I believe to be unbreakable. That's, mm -hmm. I think, where for me, it was why it was the thing that I needed to change because and because of the fact that I grew up with an alcoholic parent and I had a lot of other, you know, I had a lot of uh, beliefs around alcohol that I needed to change. And that's, I think, the thing. It's when I talk about in my work, I talk about the behavior map result cycle. I talk about learning this idea that your thoughts create your feelings that drive your actions that get the results you have in your life, right? And because if we don't learn to manage our minds and to your what you're kind of saying is if we do not learn to make that connection because we do not reach for alcohol just 
you know, blindly and mm-hmm. people, people want to say it's because it tastes good. I just like it, et cetera. No, we, we learn to reach for alcohol because we believe we are getting something out of the glass. It's solving for something. It's solving for your nerves walking into a, a party. You don't want to feel nervous and you want to feel more calm. And so you're, you're worried or social anxiety, you know, you want to be looser. People believe they can't do that on their own. They believe that they need alcohol to help them. They, we, we have a lot of stories that we build up and learn around alcohol that simply aren't true. And we can learn to be those people, but we have to be willing to do the work to your point. You have to be willing to do the work. And I agree with you. I work with a lot of people about, I, t- I say humans because I never want to be like, it's all for me, all women of a certain, you know, and, right. and, and you and I are in totally different, different age brackets, demographics, you know, et cetera. Right. And so I love that because it's important for us to engage this conversation across all humans because yep. there are, and, and I do believe men, men want to focus on the action and they don't want to focus on the, the, the thought work that goes into it. And until you really address why you're drinking in the first place and what you're looking for in the glass and learning that you can actually find that without drinking, it's not sustainable change, right? You can, Absolutely. you can willpower yourself through for only so long, but if you don't learn how to manage your mind and become a better thinker, at least that's how I talk about it. You won't, that, that sustainable, peaceful change won't exist. Absolutely, Molly. I mean, and you hit the nail on the head. So the, the book Bamboza, we kind of break it up into four parts, right? The first part is like, why do you do it? Why do you do it? We want people to understand why you drink because a lot of people don't get it. Like to your point, they're not educated on how you're socially engineered and what drinking does for our life because you, it's mindless that it becomes such a habit that we don't think about it. So we focus on that first. And the second part, we talk about like, what will it do? Um, why, why do you have the gain? So we talk around the concept of all right why do you do it and then second why do you have the gang like all the different aspects of career life fitness finance all of that good stuff the third part is the part that i want to hit on with what you just said is how do you do it and we have this concept called the meds m-e-d-s and now that i'm thinking about it i think i'm gonna add two d's because it's a concept of decadism <laughs> that i think is important to talk about but m-e-d-s stands for mental reengineering exercise commitment diet improvement and success seeking. And that first aspect, mental re-engineering is so important. And what I tell people, when you start to think about not drinking anymore and giving it up, do not stop immediately. I tell people don't. I tell yeah, people good. your goal, you what you should start doing is just educating yourself reading books, listening to podcasts, learning what alcohol can potentially do to you and continue the drink to then see, are you seeing that in yourself? Can you now recognize? One of the things I tell people all the time that's so ridiculous, I never made the connection that when I used to wake up at two or three o'clock in the morning and couldn't go back Mm. to sleep, that it was because (laughs) of alcohol. Never made that connection until I stopped drinking and started reading about it and recognized that that was going to get my life. So once you read and you're drinking, you can see, is this happening to me? Am I using alcohol as this crutch? Do I now recognize every time I go on a party, it's not that I just want to get a drink because I, it tastes good. It's because if I don't get up a drink, I feel weird. There's something Mm -hmm. there. The book said this would be the case. So then once you recognize that, then you can make the decision of, all right, I want to give up alcohol because I can see that the science of everything they're saying that it's doing to me is actually taking place. The next aspects are exercise commitment, because I truly believe that it's a couple of things you get with when, when you give up alcohol that we all know about. One of the big things is time. When you stop drinking, you will have a lot of extra time on your hands and you got to figure out a way to fill that time. So I tell Mm -hmm. people, there's very few things. Might as well better. exercise, right? Yeah. Might as well exercise, right? But the other side of that is that exercise is known scientifically to reduce cravings. Like it helps you because you're 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 used to the do- artificial dopamine spike of alcohol. You need something to substitute that. And there are very few things that can give you that dopamine equals or somewhat equals spike than exercise. And I'm a big believer of 
when we change internally, that's one thing and we can feel the change inside, but it helps us and motivates us if we can see the change too. So I always think exercising is that way. If you just want to like someone to be like, man, you look great. I can see you're slimming now. It's just that little extra motivator that helps you continually say, okay, this is a good thing. Third thing is diet improvement. The reason I say diet improvement is because if you exercise a lot and then you eat whatever you want to, you may not see the change that you <laughs> want to see. So they, they're just connected hand in hand. But the other aspect is that scientifically, if you eat better, more whole foods, you get your vitamin B from folate, um, you get your vitamin D for serotonin, it makes you feel better. I think they did a study that said that people that eat better, more whole foods and, and better quality foods are typically 25 to 35% less at risk for depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. And that's what alcohol wants. Like that's part of the reason we do it because of that, those type of feelings. So by eating better, you decrease the chances that that happens. And the last thing is what I tell people is so important. It's called success seeking. And for success seeking for me, it's around, and this is what we talked about earlier. When you stop drinking, you've given yourself a gift. Like you really have. You've given yourself the ability to think more clearly. Your cognitive recognition is greater than it's ever been before. And you can do amazing things. Sometimes the reason people go back to drinking is because after they drink, because you, to your point earlier, when you first start drinking, it's like this, everything is great. And you're like, everything's exciting. Everything's amazing. But eventually our life just mellows off because homeostasis takes place. And even though our life is better, it may feel home drum because a uh, humdrum because we're just so used to it. We've been doing it now for a year, a year and a half. And some people go back to drinking because they don't feel like their life is amazing or they feel like I've done it or I've stopped drinking long enough that it doesn't affect me anymore. So I should be okay going back to it. I tell people, you're giving yourself a gift. You need to use that gift to do something amazing so you know that your previous alcohol conscious self could never accomplish what you're now accomplishing with the gift you're giving yourself from being alcohol conscious. So what I mean by that, for me, I tended to learn Korean. My wife is Korean. Her, I want to talk to my, my in-law. So for me, I wanted to learn how to speak Korean freak, um, fluently. There is no way the pre-AC Ken <laughs> Middleton could have learned Korean. There's no way. But, 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 but now about having that goal of a three to five year goal of learning Korean, I'm pushing myself mentally and using the gift I've given myself to not drink, to make that excitement of when things seem like they're normal, I know I'm still growing, just not at the same pace, but it's keeping me focused on the prize to say, I can never go back to drinking because I have such a long-term goal that I want to accomplish that my former self would have never been. So it's so that. important to have that goal in your life. I love that. Yeah. And I think that kind of just feeds into what, like I say all the time, what I, what I've shared with you about being a better thinker, right? Yes. Here's the thing. Life is going to be 50, 50. It's going to be good. It's going to be bad. I want to, I want to be able to experience the whole human experience and believe that I can handle it without alcohol when right. Or anything else. So whether it's alcohol or food or gambling or social media or TV or any other numerous unhealthy th things that people use to cope with, you know, negative emotion, right? This, the emotions that they don't want to feel, uncomfortable things they don't want to feel. Whether you become alcohol conscious, alcohol minimalist, totally alcohol free, I guarantee you that life isn't going to be like, it isn't the answer to being, everything's going to be perfect. Everything's going to be great. You know, you're never going to have another bad day in your life. No, sorry. Bad days are coming because that's life. And they're, but so are the wonderful days. So are the exhilarating days. For me, it's all about feeling empowered and wanting right. to know that I have the power within me to create the life that I want to create. And definitely when you have a minimalist relationship with alcohol, a conscious relationship, or you're completely alcohol free, you got a lot more energy and a lot more bandwidth, mental bandwidth, cognition, creative, you know, energy to create the life that you want to have. Right. And that's, I mean, I could not, I'm in the same boat. I couldn't do what I do. I could not do what I do if I wasn't an alcohol minimalist, if I didn't really, you know, embrace this idea of not having a very low, I don't, I just don't drink that much period right. anymore. I don't drink hardly at all in terms of 
compared to much more in the, I, I used to be in the top, in that, in that top, top percentile of drinkers right. of the United States. I'm much closer to the, to the 60, to the, to the majority now. And it's great. And I want people to understand, and I think you agree with me here. It's possible. I right. don't believe it's absolutely possible. And it's absolutely great. It takes commitment. It takes some work, but it's absolutely possible for people to do this. You can create the relationship. You can become conscious. You can do this. And all you got to do is keep going. You got to keep, you just got to keep trying. That's it. That's it. And I think what you said earlier is something I want to press upon to the audience is so important. Alcohol does not solve all of your problems. <laughs> stop right. drinking that. The stop drinking alcohol doesn't solve all of your problems. Just because you stop drinking, that doesn't mean your life is going to be perfect. But what it does do is allow you now to have the emotional fortitude and the mental capability to address all of those problems. Because mm -hmm. when you're drinking, you don't have to do it. It, it is, um, what a, it's, it's, it's the band-aid of life, if you will. It's the great band-aid of life. You don't have to address any problem because you can just drink it and not have to think about it. Goes it goes away for a while, yeah. It goes away for a little <laughs> while. And when it comes back, guess what? There's another six pack of Heineken you can go buy that make it go away again. But when you stop drinking, that problem is gonna hit you in the face. And I, and I, and I tell people this all the time and I don't mean to sugarcoat it. It some oftentimes it's going to get harder before it gets easier. And you have mm -hmm. to expect that there's going to be a time. And I use this analogy to everybody when they talk about quitting alcohol and then um, why people do it and how when you do it, it, it feels like your life is more challenging and you don't want to do it anymore. So you go back to drinking. But it's like steroids, right? Steroids are going to make it easier for you to lift weights and to grow and to be strong. But the, the trade offs that you're making for steroids eventually are going to catch up with you. When you drink consistently, it may make your life easier to deal with in that time, but eventually it's going to catch up with you. It yeah. will catch up with you, especially if you're drinking that consistent over um, 15 to 25 drinks a week. And you will become an, an you. it will get there. I will promise you. And so I tell people it may be harder when if you all of a sudden you're doing steroids and you take the steroids away and you go to the gym, it's going to be really, really hard to lift. You won't be able to come close to lifting the amount of weights you could lift before. But if you keep putting in the work, you keep growing, you can eventually get to where you were before and be even stronger. But you got to know there's going to be a little bit of dip before you get to where you want to go. But it's about that long-term vision that's going to get you there. So yeah. I just want to be clear at people. Alcohol makes a lot of things better, but it doesn't, it's not drinking alcohol makes a lot of things better, but it doesn't solve all of your problems. You got to yeah. do the, you have the ability and you have to do the hard work to do that yourself. Yeah. I say it all the time. We can do hard things. We yep. can do hard things, right? So Ken Middleton, tell, tell my listeners where they can connect with you. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I'm on all the, the platforms, if you will. So first there's the bamboozlebook.com. So if you want to go there now, you can sign up for the advanced reader list so you can get all my updates. So when the book is going to be officially released, you can actually get a, a excerpt from the book. Chapter two, we talk about college and how that affects our life and how we're socially engineered and how it affects our life in the future. So you can get that chapter today if you go to that website. So the bamboozlebook.com. Um, then you can go find me, anuf.com, which is a medium publication that you can read my writing and all of my other peers writing about alcohol consciousness and how alcohol is not your friend in life. And then, of course, uh, kenanmiddleton.com. If you go to kenanmiddleton.com, that is my website. Um, where I'm same thing on Instagram, LinkedIn, everywhere, kenanmiddleton.com. You can find me um, and just learn about my blog and my fitness um, endeavors and things of that nature. Awesome. And I will put all of those links in the show notes, folks, so you can find it. I love the I love the title, Ken. I didn't even say that to you. Bamboozled. That's just fantastic. What a great title. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love How it. Alcohol makes fools of us all, without a doubt. Right? It was something my wife and I can't like I was talking to my wife a year and a half. We were driving and the title hit me in the head. <laughs> and I told right? her and she you're was like, like, that's it. That's it. Right. <laughs> that's yeah. It. Yeah. Yep. I hear you. So that's awesome. It has been a joy to talk with you, Ken Middleton, and um, I will definitely link everything in the show notes, folks. You can find him. And I'm imagining this Venn diagram, right? Because like all alcohol minimalists are alcohol conscious people, all conscious, yeah. right? Like, so we're kind of yes. like, yeah. So I think that we overlap on so much and I just wish you all the best with the book and please go check it out, folks, and check Ken's work out as well. Thanks, Molly. Thank you for listening to the Alcohol Minimalist Podcast. 
This podcast is dedicated to helping you change your drinking habits and to create a peaceful relationship with alcohol. Use something you learned in today's episode and apply it to your life this week. Transformation is possible. You have the power to change your relationship with alcohol now. For more information, please visit me at www.mollywatts.com.